Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to an... Well, I shouldn't say another, but to our Slammiversary 15 review show live here on Mixler.com backslash NerdCorp. You can find us, as always, at our central hub, the, the singular place for all things NerdCorp, and that's realnerdcorp.com, R-E-A-L-N-E-R-D-C-O-R-P. Joining me, as always, my co-host, Marcus Green. Marcus can be found at Paradox Kid, P-A-R-A-D-O-X-K-I-D. Marcus, how you doing? I'm good. Uh, coming off of Slammiversary, a lot of things happened. Some expected, some not expected. Let's get into it. So tonight's show is obviously the 15th anniversary, and uh, we we didn't get too many uh, in the way, things in the way of surprises. But I would say overall, it was a damn good show. A lot of great wrestling, a lot of great moments. Uh, I mean, we had some surprises in the ring, but nothing in, in the way of. No, there was no Hall of Fame announcement. There was no um, like surprise debuts or, or, or sh- what have you. But there were some returns, and we'll get to those. But uh, let's get to the first match. Now, you said you didn't see the first match. I didn't see the women's match, so we're going to equal each other out here. <laughs> um, the opening match, Marcus, I think is it's in that conversation for match of the year. There was only oh, one wow. moment that I thought, it kind of lacked, and it was when Drago tried to go and do like a big spot, but he slipped. But mm. but that's kind of a Lucha thing. I know I don't know if a lot of people know this, but Luchas tend to botch far more regularly than uh, than you know strong style Japanese wrestlers or American pro wrestlers, and it's not for any racist reason. It's because they are more um, accustomed to the ring uh, down in Mexico, which is generally speaking a lot more springy than elsewhere so they're accustomed to leaping off things and even in mexico they tend to slip up because they take a lot more high risk so there's a lot more opportunities to botch it's like a a basketball player who shoots a lot of threes he's gonna probably miss if he takes the most threes in in the nba he's gonna have the most misses just based off of simple logic you know so it's one of those things it wasn't a big deal they recovered nicely uh, LAX got the win, but El Hijo de El Fantasma, which was a, it, which is a King Cuerno, for those of you unaware, and um, Hector Garza Jr. really brought a lot of intensity to this match. They were both, I think, in my opinion, the MVPs. They were constantly making big plays, big moves, big spots. Uh, definitely enjoyed the hell out of it. The uh, the Noah team, which ended up being uh, Naomi. Mi- God damn it, here we go. <laughs> Naomichi Marafuji and Taiji I- Ishimori, um, they're kind of like a super team because Ishimori is the uh, GHC light heavyweight tag team champion, and Marafuji is the GHC heavyweight tag team champion. So they had a, a, a kind of an all-star team for this match, and I thought that was pretty cool. Um, Ishimori um, definitely had some moments where I thought he could have had a better bit of a balance in terms of what to do in the match. But everyone else was fantastic. This is legitimately probably my favorite match of the night because it, it was an all-star collection from you know Pro Wrestling Noah, AAA, Lucha Underground, um, Crash, and Impact. So it was good stuff to see. Uh, Santana looked like a million bucks as always. Ortiz is still one of those dudes like he's like five foot two. Yeah, he's like a hundred pounds, and he's the he's the 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 muscle. Yeah, the muscle is like the pocket Hernandez. <laughs> Right, like really, mm, really, mm, I don't think so. So that that dynamic has always thrown me off. Although I think Santana's a star, dude. Like I see him, and he looks kind of like Eddie Kingston. So I think that helps because I think Kingston's a star, yeah, but that's yeah. just my. A lot of a lot of swag from Santana all the way. Yeah. Oh, he he really does. He's got a lot of charisma. He he's their best wrestler in, in, in that stable by by far. Uh, Diamante got involved a lot in this match. At one point, she was thrown right onto Phantasma, and I was like. Well, I'm jealous. Uh, other points, she got involved and really kind of t- took the piss out of uh, the Crash team, uh, Garza and Laredo Kid. So they really upped, and Homicide got involved. So they really had that gang dynamic that LAX is going for involved in this match. They are able to up what their stable, what their gimmick is during the course of the match, which is how you develop as a character. And it's also when you really know the foundations or, or, or you're able to showcase who you are and that's when you know you're, you're better than the rest is when you're able to bring these things into your matches and I think LAX did a great job with that overall like this is a beautiful fucking match so you know I, I, I hats off to everyone involved it was it was truly perfecto yeah 
Yeah, I'm looking forward to treating myself to it afterwards. Glad to hear uh, home team LAX retain. Like I said, they're on fire right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, looking to see who steps up to take them on um, after Slammiversary because, you know, we got uh, Reno Scum getting back into things. And That's obviously, just about you know, to say, oi, oi, oi. Exactly. And you can't forget about, you know, um, the uh, the war the war veterans. So, veterans of war, uh, yeah. Yeah, veterans of war who kind of cool down, but hopefully they get back to the swing of it. So you know. Yeah, the trip to uh, India has kind of cooled off a lot of guys. Magnus, Matt Morgan, veterans of war, to name a few. You know, none of them were at the show tonight, or at least weren't uh, on camera at any point. So it, it kind of takes you out uh, of. I don't want to say out of relevancy, but you need to re-inject yourself in a dynamic way upon return. So we'll see what those individuals and others like Eva Story and. Um, MJ Jenkins, like let's see what these these individuals can do now that they're back in Orlando. Uh, we will talk uh, at the end of this a uh, little bit about the rebranding and something that Jeff Jarrett said in the interview about the rebranding that I think people should really be excited about. Uh, the tag team match that came next, uh, I I thought was a mistake heading into it because this the opening tag team match that the titles uh, the the titles is the tag team titles were so good that I thought opening or, or following with a second tag match was a bit of a mistake. However, I was so wrong. D'Angelo Williams and Moose come down. They're accompanied by, uh, I think, a NASCAR racer, Austin Dillon, and former Cleveland Browns Pro Bowl tight end Gary Barnage. And I've been saying this for weeks, Marcus. You can attest to this. I would love to see Barnage and D'Angelo Williams join Impact and call themselves the Pro Bowlers. I think that would be a fantastic tag team. I knew Adonis and Eli Drake were going to make D'Angelo Williams look better than he was. I knew that was going to be the case heading in. However, you didn't know I, how much help he was going to give him. Yeah, right. These Adonis and, and and Drake were picked for this match for a reason because they work well with Moose and they can help Williams look great. However, I didn't realize how great D'Angelo Williams would look on his own. He was maybe the highlight of the night because it was so unexpected. He took some risks. And with the exception of, of a of a slightly blown table spot at the end, he was perfect throughout the night. He sold. He he took bums. He he did a kick a kip up. Like he did everything you would really want a wrestler to do. And like there there were times Marcus watching this where I'm like, D'Angelo Williams is moving and understanding more things better than Enzo Amore or half the WWE roster does right now. Like I think D'Angelo Williams today is better than most of the homegrown NXT talent still in NXT. I would I would argue that he would put on a better match than any of them. I don't know how you feel, so let's ask how you feel about that. I mean, it looked damn good. I mean, I think obviously you could tell this by the, the hype videos, um, you know, showing him training and whatnot. That he literally, you know, he really does have a, a, a passion and a respect for it, two things that you need. Um, definitely going into that ring, but you know, above all, obviously you got the discipline, the nat- natural athleticism stemming from his football career, and the discipline coming from football as well. So. Uh, it's kind of a on the outside looking in it seems like a recipe for success but we've seen extreme failures in the past so mm-hmm. for him to come in you know do what he did you know not try to overshoot anything or when I say overshoot I mean you know do something that's kind of completely out of his realm just because you know he's hyped in the middle of the match trying to do a shooting star and thing he what he did he did extremely well mm-hmm. and he improvised where he needed to and he, and, he, and he worked well and he looked like he was supposed to be in there which we can't say uh, for a lot of guys that's, you know, come from a different world into pro wrestling. So, you know, hats off to him. Like you said, besides that table spot, man, uh, which can happen to anybody, really. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, th- I thought he did a, a damn good job. I agree. I agree completely. Uh, he really made me feel like he was somebody that you could really build around if he decided to come into uh, pro wrestling full time. So... That right there made me all the much more um, happy with how everything went. So overall, you know, D'Angelo Williams' uh, debut in a pro wrestling ring was fantastic. You know, it it was truly fantastic. I I, I can't rave uh, enough about how good he looked and how fluid he was because he... You couldn't have asked for a better debut for a guy, honestly. Like, Stephen Amell was good, but he wasn't this good. You know, Kevin Green I thought was the all-time best in terms of part-time wrestlers who were football players. I love Kevin Green still do to this day, but I think D'Angelo Williams outshone him because D'Angelo Williams uh, wasn't as limited physically as Kevin Green was because Kevin Green was a big dude who 
uh, you know, was always put up against like uh, Hogan or Flair guys who, yeah, they can work, but at that point weren't the same workers they used to be, or like the giant big show. So D'Angelo Williams was in the perfect opportunity to make himself look like a million bucks, and he did just that, and perfect, just fucking perfect across the board. Eli Drake did uh, have a little tiny botch, but it, it worked so well because he kind of just blew it off. And Adonis and Moose have amazing chemistry together. I know Adonis isn't this guy who people are clamoring to see, but I wouldn't mind a Moose Adonis feud. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Obviously, you know, I talked about this um, on Russell Talk, but yeah, Adonis is one of those guys. He still got something kind of. You know the show after you know that whole WWE run. I think he got a lot of potential. He just necessarily hasn't hit that that second gear, if you will. But you know Drake, you know you can put him in any situation. He can knock the ball out of the park. I just don't necessarily think he needs somebody at times where it feels like tagging along. At this point, I feel like Drake should really be in a heated singles feud with Moose for that title. Now, obviously, we talked about it before. You tweeted about it. He agreed. He doesn't need a title, but. You know, this is also a guy you don't want to waste in any form or fashion because no. he is so talented. So um, it's going to be interesting seeing what they do with, you know, specifically the two of them, you know, coming after this match. But, yeah, like you said, those are the two perfect guys to put in there. And kudos to all those guys for – because it felt like they improvised after that table spot. Like, look, let's go ahead and, and mm-hmm. make that table useful and put Drake through. So I feel like they improvised and, and good on them doing that. So. I wouldn't be surprised if Drake kind of grabbed Moose on like after the match and been like, "I'm gonna go up the ramp, drag me down, and put me in there." Like I wouldn't yeah. be surprised because Drake is so good at working the crowd, working the match. He's not, you know, he's not, you know, uh, uh, Zack Saber Jr. or or Okada or even Davy Richards. But what Eli Drake brings to the table is almost the perfect ability to get the crowd to do what he wants them to do. So it's one of those things where I'm not that at all surprised that this was something that happened, that he was able to convince, you know, Moose to... Do. I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case, I should say. Not that he did, because I don't know. It could have been Moose, it could have been D'Angelo, who knows. But, you know, they set him up, you know, he goes through the table, D'Angelo looks like a million bucks, uh, Adonis eats the loss, which, you know, I, I said he would from the get-go. But overall, this was a hell of a match, and, and one that I think... I'm I'm gonna say it in a, in a very harsh way, but it, it's not meant to be. This match had no right being as good as it was. Like on paper, it shouldn't have been that good. You know, Adonis isn't known for his work rate. Moose isn't known for his work rate. And then you bring in D'Angelo, who's two months of training, and it was one of the best matches on the card. So, you know, all things being you know even, it shouldn't have been as good as it was. <laughs> but it was. Yeah, it, was it was better than it could have been. So yeah. Yeah, and kudos to that crowd because they didn't shit on it at all. No, like no. They, you know, they gave it time to you know do what it needed to do. It allowed them to be themselves entertained by what they were saying, and you know they responded accordingly. So kudos to them. Uh, one thing I will say is it did feel like the crowd after the uh, no DQ match kind of lost some steam because they were, they were hot the entire night and they were still hot for the second half. But my point would be to maybe more companies should think about doing intermissions like New Japan does. Give the give the crowd twenty minutes to cool off, calm down. Every other this sport is, does. Yeah, yeah pee, drink, eat, get you know, get some popcorn or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that is uh, that is true. It's like a real sport. Yeah. So, so I would say do do a twenty minute inter- intermission, and and if you had done that, I think you would have kept the crowd. I, I the crowd was a ten for the first hour and a half. They dropped to like a, a seven and a half for the second half. I'm not shitting on the crowd. I I slammiversary. Uh, uh, what would you, uh, they would be uh, 14, 13, and 12 had uh, next to dead crowds. This crowd was hot. This c- crowd was like Slammiversary's 2005 hot. So that's a good thing. I just think that if you put out a little break in between, you know, you go get a pop, you know, beer or what have you, you take a second, you, you go, ah, that was a good first half. Let's see what they got in the, in the second half. And and it kind of it, it kind of brings you back up. Um, next match, though, was the EC3 James Storm strap match. They did a really interesting storyline here where during the course of the match, Ethan uh, yanked Storm into a, a, the uh, ring post, and like it kind of dazed him for a second. Uh, he, I think uh, Ethan hit him with the one percenter, if I remember correctly, afterwards. Storm kicked out. Storm fought to his feet, hit Ethan with a, a super kick, 
or last call, I should say. And then when he was setting up for a second last call, uh, Storm kind of just toppled over. And Ethan hit this nasty tiger driver of sorts. Like He set him up like a pedigree, but lifted him up like a pile driver and dropped him. But it was kind of more like a face buster kind of thing. So like it was weird. So I don't know what you would call it, but it looked awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of felt like a modified uh, angel's wings. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I would I would say that's exactly what it kind of looked like. Only kind of had more of, like a, of an X-Factor fallout, if you will. Because the angel's wings, Daniels would take them up vertically – and then drop them out while this more felt like a uh, pile driver slash pedigree. So it was like a different kind of motion to get to the same spot. But you, it was fucking cool, and it, it uh, really put over Storm as this, and not Storm, uh, Carter as this real big douchebag because the ref's like, hey, just pin him. And, and Flores and Don West, who we'll get to later, uh, they they're just like, it sounds like the ref just wants him to pin him and get the match over with. And then Storm hits that move, and you're like, oh, my God, what a dick. And I was like, that's a good way to get some heat. It do- See, here's the thing with wrestling. Sometimes you do the right decision in storyline, but it's not the right decision for the match. I feel like the decision f- to end the match the way it was did hamper how you would grade it overall. But the end game was to make Carter a bigger heel, and I feel it accomplished that, so it's like, all right, you know, it's not the five-star classic one would want it to be, but it did its job, and that's what you're really going for, so kudos. Better than the Kazarian uh, Hangman page strap match, though, without even a question. <laughs> yeah. That wasn't um, even a strap match. That was a I-got-things-in-my-wrist match. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they, you know, God bless them, they tried, but yeah, this uh, match was definitely fueled by, you know, the story, and, and kudos to Impact. One of the best things they've done over the past year has been they've had some phenomenal video packages. Yeah. And, they, and, and I'm know, glad they've been back to that because they had shit ones under Pritchard and Carter. Yeah, yeah, just real, you know, basic, you know, run of the mill, kind of just half ass at times. But these was, you know, all. thorough and kind of, yeah, and harking back to those, you know, old TNA days. So, you know, coming into this match, you know, Storm had to kick this guy's ass if I'm a daughter of it. That's what he was doing. So, like you said, for that that uh, ring pole spot. And then for him to kind of just collapse, you know, that was a that was a great thing. Obviously, EC3 got the win, but this can kind of keep this thing going uh, for however long they needed to. Because obviously, the goal is to get these two back in some form or fashion around the world title picture. So, um, yeah, I thought I thought it was good. You know, like I said, I don't think Storm got as in thorough strap shots to EC3 as EC3 got. Because obviously, when EC3 did it, the strap wasn't attached. But you know, he definitely got revenge. Thirty one. Third and one for revenge, and, and, and another one to grow on. So, the, the oh man, like the, those the, those uh, straps at the start uh, of the the Mumbai tapings were at the end of the Orlando. I forget when they were. Were vicious and fucking crazy, but the straps that uh, Storm laid into Ethan, I thought were not as concussive or as impressive visually, but. St- Storm went off on Carter, hitting him 31 times with, like, a little five-second break but not relenting at all. Like, I was like, wow, that has to suck. (laughs) Uh, Before we go any further, I do want to uh, bring up the opening. Uh, We have this – actually, we'll do the opening, we'll talk the announcers, and then we'll talk about the rebranding stuff at the end of the show. Let's just get through the show before we get to any of that. Um, So after that, we got the awesome no-DQ tag team match. Like, this was phenomenal. If you need to know who created the Broken Brilliance, it was it, it was on display here. We had Broken Shark Boy, Broken Abyss, Broken Scott Steiner, Marcus. I love comedy wrestling, and I don't think I've ever seen a match as funny as this match. Like it starts off as a real match. Uh, Abyss starts yeah. off with Josh Matthews, and he looked all right. No, he 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 wasn't D'Angelo uh, Williams impressive, but for a dude who hasn't wrestled in fifteen years, very it's not serviceable. Bad. Yeah, it's not bad. So he looked pretty solid, and, and Abyss, you know, or, or Joseph Park, you know, he, he, he tries. He, he's beyond his prime. You know, he, he's no longer the monster he once was. And I think he's, like, 43 now. Yeah, he's 43. He'll be 44 this year. And he lives in Cleveland, Ohio, by the way. Just got to put that out there. Um, so they're, they tag up with Jeremy. You know, they're doing their thing. Uh, Borash tags in to face off with, with Matthews, but Matthews tags in for Scott Steiner. And that's kind of where shit goes awry. And Park and, and, and um, Matthews end up getting chased to the back by Scott Steiner and uh, Josh Matthews. And they basically just start running. 
and Josh and Scott come in pursuit, and and Josh is you know hot on his heels, and Scott's like, "Hey, Josh, get in the cart!" They hop in this golf cart, and they just start chasing them down. <laughs> They come around the corner, and, and JB and, and, and Park has this fire extinguisher, and they blast Steiner and Josh with the fire extinguisher, and they stop, and Scott's like, where the hell are we? <laughs> and and then, like, Scott says something like, uh, it tastes like flan. <laughs> I was like, what? So then they, they go back on foot chasing down JB and, and uh, uh, Park and, they, and I think it was the dude from the uh, the, the broken uh, stuff from Bound for Glory yeah nobody sodomized my boy my boy little sodomized <laughs> yep so he sees Scott Steiner he's like hey Scott Steiner and Scott Steiner slams his hand against the door and yanks him out and then they hop in his SUV so they've already upgraded and then they just start toying with JB and, and Park as, the, as they chase them down in this SUV and it was hilarious. They're busting jokes. Scott Steiner's like, did it brighten off my teeth? Because uh, he's talking about the uh, the fire extinguisher. It was fucking hilarious. And then they split off, and basically Park's whole thing was he gets thrown through a door, and Scott Steiner continues on his way. But Josh and JB go to the poolside area near the resort, and they go in the pool, and like the, the crowd's popping for everything. Like, they're, they're going fucking ape shit. And while Josh has JB under the water, all of a sudden you just see a fin come into screen. And then, like, you hear Josh Matthews yelp, and JB gets out of the pool, and Josh is like, what the hell was that? And then <laughs> you see in the water, it, it, it's Shark Boy, and, it, and and he's, like, doing his thing, but he's underwater, so you can't hear him. So they so they gave you text, and it's like, oh, shell, oh, yeah. Oh, shell, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to never do it again. I'm just going to let you do it, because that was I'm giving you two thumbs up, sir, because that was phenomenal. So, like, <laughs> so we go back to to Joe, and Joe's like, "Ooh, I got thrown through a wall!" Like he's got that dazed and confused look. But then you see step, step, step. You see these very, very nice shoes coming into frame. Maybe Gucci or Versace. <laughs> and you pan up, and you see a red suit. And already at home, I'm like, "Ooh." <laughs> I, I know who it is. And then they pull back, and there's James Mitchell. And he pulls out the mask, and he's like, It's time to be the monster I know you can be, or something to that effect. And then we cut to the ring, and JB gets chased to the ring by Matthews and Steiner, and, and they're beating up on him. And Shark Boy comes out, and they're all dry. We need to point this out. They are dry as a bone. I don't care if that wasn't the if if they had intended not to be that way, or if they're like, hey, let's just you know go into the pool and then be dry and be funny because that who this is not about being logical. It's about having fun. So I I hope they're like, fuck it, we'll just be dry when we go to the ring with our clothes. Like that'd be f- fucking hilarious. So Shark Boy rolls in and he gets decimated. Scott Steiner throws a few suplexes on Sharky, and I was like, hmm, he's 127, but he can still suplex you. Awesome. They put uh, JB in the Steiner recliner, and to his credit, it's like, a good 30 seconds, and he doesn't tap out or pass out, and then Abyss comes out with James Mitchell in tow, and this is where shit gets really funky because Steiner ends up, you know, tumbling to the uh, floor, and, and th- then there's thumbtacks that get introduced, right? And it looks like for a second, you know, Josh is going to go into the thumbtacks, and then he, then he, you know, stops it, and then it looks like Abyss is going into the thumbtacks, but then Abyss catches him, spins him around a black hole, stops bring him back around and throws him into the thumbtacks and Abyss just points to JB and goes jump so JB climbs to the top rope lands on top of Josh but his hands go into the thumbtacks like significantly because he was supposed to get the pin so he rolls off and he starts clutching his hands and Park's like oh whatever and Abyss hops down and covers him and then like JB tries to help <laughs> one two three end of the match it was beautiful this was better than than Bound for Glory's uh, uh, delete. Oh, no, no, what was that one? The Great War. Yeah, the Great War. Yeah, I, I would say that the uh, no DQ announcers match, or as we can call it, the Return of Shark Boy, was better than the Great War, mostly because it was supposed to be silly and it wasn't for anything important. While the Great War was a tag team title match and it was done it, to hide Matt Hardy's deficiencies. Look, the bit look. I mean, really, what this match was, it was, like you said, comedy, but it was also what you basically defined what Slammiversary was, very much embracing, celebrating the company's anniversary while, you know, kind of encompassing everything that's come in those 15, Mm -hmm. I mean, however many years. So that's why you got the great callbacks. And, look, 
you know, we've seen countless things in wrestling throughout the years, you know, some good, some great, some absolutely horrible. And a lot of times with these uh, deletion stuff, it, it was entertaining, but unanimously it was kind of, it was a bunch of fuckery. It's what it was. Yeah. And this was fuckery to the best degree, mm-hmm. is, is all I can say. Like, it, they could have did that pan up of James Mitchell and it could have turned out to be Curry Man. Like, they could have <laughs> went there. But it was because of the red. Mm-hmm. But they went with James Mitchell, great return, Shark Boy. Always a treat, a delight. Anytime they use him, and uh, yeah, you knew the abyss thing was coming. So, but to have Scott Steiner, you know that's gonna be a gift on the internet all week. Uh, Chase the caller, be way your fat ass. You're like Josh. I'm not. I'm not running after those fat asses. Get in the car. <laughs> Josh, you drive. Let's get those fat asses. <laughs> just, just, I mean, prices. Like I seen people. Who normally crap on Impact tweeting how entertaining this was. So that that thumbs up all the way around. Like I said, good the good version of fuckery. Bad yeah. version would be from this latest Impact with that whole spud yeah, swap or whatever. Yeah, that was not good. So, yeah. I wish we could have saw spud, but they did the the stretcher angle on, on Thursday, so it wouldn't have been great. Because even though I think Swaggle's a douche in, in the ring and in real life, you still sell it, right? Like, if you're going to be, be involved, like, be the professional and sell it. So having Spud on TV would have been, you know, passe, if you yeah. will. But I would I would like to have seen Spud tonight. But I did love this this little thing because unlike, you know, the the, the Delete or Decay or the, or the, we'll just call it the Delete series, if you will, that was, like, your staple feud, like Matt versus Jeff. Then it was Matt and Jeff versus a, the, the Decay, and it was like, yeah, I, I, I sat here and said it was very enjoyable, and I, I'm not backtracking off that. But I'm also going to sit here and tell you that when it's supposed to be this very serious thing for very serious reasons, like for the tag team title or for a blood feud, it doesn't work as well because it's supposed to be it's supposed to be more than it is. And then you see something like this, where at best, if it was a wrestling match, it was the worst match of the night. At worst, it makes the company look like idiots. So to basically do it in a way that is entertaining, got all kinds of pops, brought the crowd. They were louder at, in this match than anywhere else because they were. You could literally hear the audience in the audio truck. That's how this works. Like you had the audio feed from what happened last night because they recorded this last night, and you were hearing what was happening in the ring, and they were so excited and so loud you could hear it. So that was fantastic. Like. To hear them pop when Shark Boy came out, like you could hear them, and they were like a day earlier in a different location, and like it was just it was so precious and perfect, and it was comedy at its best. Scott Steiner, he's one of those guys where I I know he's he's a lunatic in real life, but he's also a company dude, and if he trusts you, if he respects you, he will do things that you don't expect him to do, like this. He basically played played a caricature of himself. And if they do more things with Scott Steiner in this regard, like they did with Matt Hardy, where they hide your limitations physically and, and play up the comedy aspect, and this becomes your new comedy bit, oh, oh, yes, please. Just no titles. No titles, no real feuds. Just keep it like this where it's silly and fun, and we get some random cameos that can pop the crowd. Like, that's that's what made this work, was it was not supposed to be taken seriously, and we didn't. So, kudos. Kudos. Fucking Kudos. Um, next match, I would say, is one of the better matches of the night, but also the biggest disappointment of the night. So I know it's it's a weird thing to be. Uh, it was only a nine-minute match, and I thought it was going to be one yeah. of, if not the longest match of the night. However, I'm kind of glad they kept it short. Like, on one hand, I wanted to see Angelina Love and Alicia Edwards, like, break one another's backs, and, and like, Davey and Eddie dying on top of a, of a 20-foot ladder, falling onto, like, a guardrail, and, like, the paramedics declaring them, like, officially dead because of how violent it was. But on the other hand, you don't actually want them to die. You don't actually want them to get hurt. And I feel like uh, Alicia, I don't think, has ever been in a match like this, and I can't remember the last time Angelina Love has been in a very serious hardcore match. So you don't want to put them at risk, and I get yeah. that. It was it, it, this match was more storyline purpose. It was this was like the um, the EC3 strap match. It was more storyline based than it was supposed to be for match of the night quality. We had a bunch of those, you know, the X Division, mm-hmm. the world title, the the opener, uh, the, the the no DQ uh, Park uh, JB match. Like there's there's a lot of like great matches. So you don't need every match to be 
you know, Okada Omega. You know, sometimes you just need a, a, a break match, and this kind of felt what, what it was. And there were some cool spots, you know. Alicia and Angelina did, you know, test one another physically, and, and the, the finish where Eddie flipped off the ladder in a set-up powerbomb, bringing Davey with him, and they went through the table together was amazing because Eddie went through one side of the table and Davey went through the other, and Davey's side broke like it's supposed to, and Eddie's side collapsed, so it actually broke in two spots, one with it going up because Eddie landed on the edge, so it spiked and went up, and Davey landing on the other side, so it went in the ground, so it lo- looked like a little bit of mountain range. It was kind of cool. And got the win. Um, I don't think this feud is over. I think we're going to get a reprieve because I think – Davey's going to beat El Patron. Like, it all depends on what happens tomorrow. We're, we're being promised a new LAX member, and, you know, Conan announced that at the end of the match. So if Conan brings out El Patron in LAX, I think Eddie will beat uh, El Patron in September and then go into Bound for Glory, which I think will probably end up being... Well, it might be in September. It might be in November. It might be in October. We'll, like, we'll see. We'll see where, when they decide to do uh, Bound for Glory. I'm saying... Des- I say December if you're going to do it. Yeah, but it's, but it's definitely not. We're not definitely not seeing a return of Hernandez. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Although part of me does miss the old school LAX. Um, but basically tomorrow night, if if El, if I think it's going to be Kingston, because Kingston is half Puerto Rican, so Kingston would have the genealogical uh, allowance to be in LAX because that's the thing with LAX. You have to be a, a, of Latino. More Hispanic, Puerto Rican, Dominican, is, is, or Spanish is, is what they mean because technically there's a lot of different Latins out there that, that don't get you know included. However, there was one time when they offered a spot to Ron Killings and one time when they offered a spot to Petey Williams. So, eh. <laughs> Maybe it's a loose affiliation. <laughs> yeah, well, both, was he, uh, defined, was he injured? King? Who, Kingston? Yeah. Or was he just off the show? Because I know Bram's uh, recovering from something serious. Well, see, here's the thing. Uh, Kingston does uh, – he, he made an announcement on an indie show about a month ago that he needs uh, surgery and he'll be out for a few months, but he's still wrestling, so I don't know if he's – he strikes me as one of those guys like Taz. Well, I, I don't I don't want to insult Kingston like that. Taz could have continued his career if he had gotten a neck surgery. That's the one thing that's oftentimes not mentioned. I don't know if Kingston's afraid of surgery like Taz is, which is what I was going for, or if Kingston wants to put some money away so he can, you know, not worry about not working for a few months while he uh, convalesces, or if he was just saying that as part of an angle for the promotion. I don't know how sincere the injury is. I, I, I'm not disputing it's severe. I just, I don't know. Like, I'm not sitting here saying, oh, well, Kingston can still wrestle because he's still wrestling. So I don't know. On the other hand, I don't know if Kingston is a Jeff Jarrett guy. Well, I don't know. No, I I said that the right way. Jeff Jarrett has stopped using certain people because he does not, not personally like them, but doesn't see the value in them. Jay Bradley was one of those cases. Uh, uh, Apparently, um, Drew Galloway was one of those cases. Jeff Jarrett really didn't want to renegotiate with Drew, and that's why Drew essentially left. He didn't really like Maria which was a big sticking point with the Maria and Mike negotiations, even though they were about to re-sign. It felt like Mike Bennett realized that if he went back to uh, TNA or Global Force, what do you want to call it, uh, that he wasn't going to be in the same spot. Like, he knew that. At the end of their feud with, with Braxton and Allie, they were already basically, you know, Braxton was a drunk. That was his entire shtick. He was constantly drunk and complaining about Maria. So I knew, you know, Mike knew that that was going to be how he was presented. So... I don't know if Kingston's a guy that Jarrett sees a lot in. I hope he does because I think Kingston's a million bucks. But we'll see. We'll see. But anyway, uh, whoever joins LAX tomorrow night will determine which one of the Wolves goes into the world title picture in in the fall. If Patron turns heel, which I think is very likely tomorrow night, after he gets the title, you know, LAX comes out, blah, blah, blah. Uh, then, Then it'll be Eddie. If he stays face, it'll be Davey. But I think either way, Eddie or Davey will be back in the title scene uh, later on. And I think next year they're going to build up to Davey, Eddie at Slammiversary for the title. I think that's the current trajectory. They have a five-year plan in place. And I guarantee you if you see Davey in the world title sequence or if he gets the world title, it's because they got Davey to sign a two-year contract. Davey has already said he's not retiring this year. He, he's working through 2018 at least, and he'll, he'll reevaluate there, he said. So we'll see how much of that, you know, you know Davey – constantly changes his mind so who fucking knows like you know he could retire tonight i don't know 
Yeah, it, it, according to the one of those videos, which were beautifully shot and, and edited and whatever. The, uh, the fight um, network kinda, ones. Yeah, yeah uh, <laughs> great stuff by them. Also has helped uh, the talent a lot. But mm-hmm. um, he kind of he kind of goes by how he feels like when he wakes up. Mm-hmm. I guess is kind of how he said it. So, yeah, that could kind of change. But also, I think um, you know, Impact has uh, done well to take care of him and obviously his, his lovely family. So, yeah, definitely go stay loyal to them. But he also has won uh, apparently some uh, indie titles this year. So, yeah, he, he's having a hell. He's having. I don't want to say a career year because 2010, I think, or 2011, when he won the Ring of Honor title, he had a career year, but. Uh, definitely, he's having a great year, like fan- phenomenal. And they wouldn't have brought back Angelina if they weren't going to reunite the beautiful people. If Davy wasn't important to them, you know. Same with Alicia; they wouldn't bring her in if Eddie wasn't part of their long-term plans. Jeff Jarrett loves the Wolves, and I think he knows that these two dudes are. And I don't mean this disparagingly; just I, from my perspective, like I think of WCW 1999's tag team era as like quintessential, like maybe the best I've ever seen. Davey and Eddie are very much Dean Malenko and Chris Benoit. You know, Eddie is that Chris Benoit. Uh, well, I would say Eddie's more Dean Malenko. Uh, doesn't really rely on mic work. He's a great in-ring tactician, you know, phenomenal worker. Davey's got a little bit more charisma. He can be that angry asshole type. So, like, these two dudes, in fact, I think Davey's significantly better as a personality than any of those three can ever be or ever would have been. So, Davey's, I think Davey's a main inventor. In this company, I think he's. I think Angela and Love and him are a great duo. You can put the belt on him, and he would be a great heel because he's convincing. He looks like a dude who, even though he's half the size of Lashley, could beat Lashley. He looks like a dude who could beat El, El-, El Patron. But I think if you're gonna like, he should win the belt at Bound for Glory. So whenever that is, if that's in October, November, December, September, he wins the belt there. If it's past October, if it's in November or December, I I, I said it, uh, before and I'll say it again, Bound for Glory in December makes more sense than anything. I would have Davey win the X Division title or the Grand Championship or both and hold them until it's time to go into the main event feud, at which case I would have him drop it to Eddie to kind of keep that going. So that's how I would go about it. <clears throat> um, next up was, oh, phenomenal. Oh, this X Division match was amazing. Yeah. I'm not a Sanjay Duck guy. Never have been. Never will be. <clears throat> but these two dudes were so on each other's wavelengths that I was genuinely impressed with somebody that I have never really been that high on. Yeah. Each match was different, too. Not like some kind of stipulation, you know, like three floors of hell, three stages of hell. No. Dutton and, and, and yeah. Loki started off in a very traditional exhibition match. And I like that. Reversals, high spots. You know, it, it, it was very much a, a, a tit for tat. Anything you can do, I can do better. And it ends with uh, Loki hitting the Warriors way and getting the three count. Would that be a fair way of saying how the first fall went more of a traditional X Division match? Yeah, yeah, and and I think with this one, though, it was just it was methodically paced because, like you said, both of those falls came. Um, well, all three really came in, in a, into a last minute count. And when Loki hit that Warriors way, it looked nasty. Mm-hmm. It looked like he stepped directly on his face. And I thought he concussed him. Yeah, I did too. The second fall was a bit more of a cat and mouse, you know, Dutts on the ropes. Loki's laying into him. Uh, Loki, sur- uh, not Loki, uh, Dutts surviving though and getting some offense in. It felt more of a, uh, more of a big man, little man kind of match. You know, Loki's yeah. taking less punishment, so he's given you know most of it to Dutt. So Dutt's on the ropes, and Dutt ends up getting a surprise victory. I think it was like what a roll up or something. Yeah, he had um, <clears throat> kind of just basically just shifted his body weight and kind of stacked him up for the for the penny. It's definitely right. a more scrappier thing, kind of showed desperation, like you said, with Loki being a, a aggressor, kind of showed some desperation for for Dutt to get back into the fight. Yeah. So, yeah. Then in the third fall became very personal. To the point where Loki striking you with kicks is kind of just his shtick. You know, a, a, a light Loki match, you'll take it like 20 kicks from Loki. Like, you just know you're going to get hit. But Loki never throws punches. It's just something he doesn't do as a character. And at this point, he's like laying into Dutt, and then he just steps back, steps into him, and throws like a right, right into Dutt's gut. And I was like, wow, we are going into personal, violent territory yeah. now. And when I saw yeah, that, I was like, it, "Ooh, <laughs> yeah!" It looked it looked like uh, one of the Rocky fights when when one of the guys is defenseless and the guy's just basically 
Yeah, kind the of bell rings and, and Apollo hits yeah. him right after the bell, and and Sylvester exactly. just crumbles into the robe like. Eh. <laughs> I don't want like you ain't getting no rematch. I don't want one. <laughs> you ain't getting one. <laughs> The, the, this though, it was very much like uh, Dutt came back hard. You know, he took that shot. They, they threw a lot more at one another, and this, the final, you know, uh, Dutt takes or gets brought up to the top rope, and Dutt fights his way off. Hits a a literally like this is what it was. It was a reverse warrior's way where he did a backflip, landed on Loki, pounced off, scrambled back on, hooked the leg, and got the three count. I was like, great, bravissimo. Great and that, you know, I forgot that was even a move of his because he'd been doing it straight mm-hmm. for you know most of the time, and then he'd been using uh, that uh, kind of reverse DDT aside, if you will. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I almost forgot that was his finisher, and then that was such a great way to finish it because they're kind of polar opposites when you kind of look at them. You know, it's kind of been a light and dark thing. Uh, uh, you know, the assassin versus the kind of more straight, narrow guy. So for him to finish him off with a reverse Warriors way, I thought was uh, just great stuff. And he absolutely nailed that move, which he always does. So, yeah, I thought this was one of my favorite matches of the night just because, like you said, each match was different that they've done in this feud. And I think each match told of where the feud was at that particular stage. Mm-hmm. And this one was very much, you know, considering the fact that he literally, Loki literally uh, ruined his celebration, uh, you know, that was, that was uh, some good stuff. So, these two might not be done either because, you know, Loki can hold the grudge. But this was a this was a really great match. I saw some people saying that the crowd cooled off. But, you know, if if they did, you know, they... It really, wasn't because of the match. Yeah. It was because the entire night you had been... This was... You had just seen that big spot with Davey and Eddie. And before that, you had just, you know, been laughing your ass off during the Abyss uh, Scott Steiner tag team match. That's why I was saying uh, uh, a a twenty minute intermission would have helped save the crowd for these last three matches because I felt like they were like they were really into it and like they're gonna go home and be like those were great matches. I wish I was more active because that's kind of how it gets. You know, you're 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 there, you're loud, you're chanting, you're screaming, and you're still invested in the last hour. But it's like I am so exhausted. People don't realize if they've never been to a wrestling event, if you get into it, you get very tired because you expel a lot of emotion. So I don't blame the crowd. I don't I, – Dutton, Loki, you know, rival uh, any match on this card for match of the night. It wasn't a bad match. There was nothing wrong with this match. It was very good. It was just – it's a long day. It's Florida in June – or July, actually. It's hot. It's muggy. It's hot in there. So, like, yeah. I, I, I don't be uh, begrudge the crowd for going a little bit quieter during the last three matches. But uh, what are you going to do? All right, so I saw the entrances for this match. Uh, Gail Kim comes out. Sienna comes out with this new headdress, which was perfect. And then Rosemary mm. comes out with, like this, with this army, this gaggle of crazy chicks. And I was like, hmm, they can't all shoot me down. <laughs> <laughs> so you say there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, after that, uh, the, the last thing I caught was Kingston and uh, Laurel Van Ness coming down. And that's when I had to dart away for a few minutes. Uh, so you know, yeah. tell us what happened. Yeah, but it's it's funny because the last thing I caught was KM taking um uh hot mess Vanessa to the back and uh Rosemary hitting the dive and then my internet went out. So Oh no. We, so some kind of way we you know, I'm assuming the rest of the match was good because uh and we we got the outcome being Sienna being a unified champion, which is interesting. I'm very much interested in seeing how she uh won because Rosemary is extremely formidable, but we haven't really seen um, anything outstanding in terms of match wise in the knockout since Jade left uh, mm-hmm. from that whole feud. So, and Sienna's been, you know, very much needing to get back into the spotlight. So I'm, I'm almost kind of glad she won, even though I'm a huge Rosemary fan because she's literally been carrying the torch since obviously Gail uh, has been out. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing exactly how they did this match because I didn't want anybody out there, no KM, no Hot Van there. So I'm glad they sent those to the back. But um, yeah, I expect these two to. Uh, really not be done because obviously Rosemary is not done with anybody until she wants to be. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing what they do with this stuff. Yeah, I know uh, Rosemary won or lost via submission, but I, I guess, you know, we both need to figure out what happened in this match. Um, did you see the world title? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, it was great seeing Gail come back, and I knew she was coming back for Slammiversary, and she'll probably be back going forward. 
because Jarrett's always been a fan of hers. You know, they're, they're, uh, Jarrett likes her a lot. We saw um, – what match was it? It was during the, uh, the the Abyss match. We saw Scott Steiner and uh, Gail Kim's husband, Robert Irvine, get into it. That was so good. It was like, like I'll be Grand Robert. I'm like, I ain't Scott. Slow up now. <laughs> Irvine – that ain't no old elderly cooking chef you grabbing on. <laughs> yeah, that ain't that ain't. Uh, um, what's his name? F- Furier, Florier, the the. Yeah, Rob, uh, Le- uh, Guy Fieri. Yeah. Guy Fieri, yeah, it's not Guy Fieri, man. Like, like back the fuck up. Uh, Josh Matthews tried to get involved. Uh, like he tried to get in uh, Irvine's face, and Irvine chucked him with one hand. <laughs> that was great. M- Matthews sold the shit out of that, and then Steiner's like, Ur. And Flora's like, well, I don't know, Ryan. You're big, but you ain't bigger than Big Papa Pump. And I'm sitting at home going, yes. <laughs> so anyway, main event time. Um, Lashley comes down with his uh, team, fight team, or whatever the fuck they were called. The funny thing is one of those dudes is, uh, is a devout, uh, uh, true blue, not making this up at all, um, um, socialist, Jeff uh, Monson. He has the hammer and sickle on his uh, on his calf, so I was like, "Well, maybe you shouldn't have brought him out, Impact, because <laughs> he's 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 kind of a sociopath." The dude is sixty one twenty six and one though, so yeah, he tried to apply for uh, Russian uh, um, citizenship last year. So the dude's the dude's weird, and he's one of Lashley's uh, training buddies, I guess. <clears throat> so that was funny to see. Uh, and El, El Patron comes out with Dos Caras and Dos Caras, uh, or El Hijo del uh, de Car, de, El Hijo Dos Caras, the son of Dos Caras. Uh, so it was a family affair for El Patron and a, and a team affair for Lashley, and I like the little dynamic there. Uh, this was a really good match. I really like this match. Um, I would have liked it more if it wasn't El Patron. I, I do have, I don't want to say it's a bias or a grudge, but there's just something about him that makes me go, all right, but all right, whatever. I don't care. Yeah, you're like, could we have gotten somebody else? Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's not taken away from his talent. It's just, you know, there, there's no spark or thrill there for you. I get it. It's the right. same thing with me. I think the hottest he was was for me um, after years of watching him in WWE, the hottest he ever was for me was when he was in that brief stint in Lucha Underground. And, mm-hmm. you know, off the end on the best of terms or what have you. However, that came to an end. But here it's just like, you know, I know some people felt the same way about Galloway, um, but Me. I was way more into Galloway, and him and, and Lashley had a phenomenal feud. So, mm-hmm. um, but it, like I said, it's nothing to take away from his Tanner. We just don't really connect with the guy. And we, yeah. You know, even when he's being serious and whatnot, it's like, you know, I, and, and I'm just a Lashley guy, so you know, mm-hmm. I'm always going to uh, rock with the uh, the Destroyer. But you know, they're going in a different direction. So, with El Patron and Drew Galloway, and even Matt Hardy to a degree, I, I saw it as if it's going to help this company that I enjoy so much, I will accept it because that's I, I don't need to watch El Patron to enjoy the rest of the show, you know? Like, for me, it's like I want Davey, I want Eddie, I want Loki, I want the, I want the knockouts, I want, the you know, Division. LAX, the X Division. So, if El Patron's going to help bring a bigger profile to this company, I will bite my tongue and be like, fine. Yeah, because he doesn't do bad wrestling. Like El Patron's a great wrestler, uh-huh. but his mic work skills are shit. Even when he's speaking in Spanish, so there's no reason for him to be so dull. And Lashley has that same issue. Like Lashley is, he does good like good sit down interviews. Like he's very kind of, you know, he has time to think about it, and he's not so much on the fly. And if he screws up, he can you know do a retake. But live, Lashley is ugh, on the mic. So, like, both these guys were just ex-MMA dudes or current MMA dudes kind of thrown down. So it had that kind of vibe where you weren't going to get a Rock Austin type of banter, but it was going to be entertaining physically, and that's exactly what it was. Like, the, both these dudes delivered a, a hell of a match. And I love the way they booked the ending where Lashley didn't so much get beat as he did screwed himself. There was points where El Patron and Lashley both got into it with the corner guys, where El Patron got in King Moe's face and Lashley got in, in Dos Caras' face. And both guys came out to help out their respective ringmen, but eventually Lashley almost became fixated on Dos Caras, chasing him around the ring and then shoving him up the ring ramp, or the, or the ramp, not the ring ramp, just the ramp. 
and kind of like, you know, this is my house, and he gets on the ring, and he's still staring at those cars as, as those cars is on the ramp, and that's when, you know, El Patron hits him with, like, like that jumping uh, shin kick, and that set up the finale where, where he hits him with that double stomp, pulls him back in the ring, and gets the three count on Lashley. So it was a very well-paced, well-executed finale because it does protect Lashley. Lashley did not lose because he got beat. He lost because he lost focus. And it's not because Dos Caras got involved. It's not because Dos Caras was, was helping his son cheat. It was because Lashley's heel persona was that of a bully, and he saw an opportunity to bully somebody, and it cost yeah. him. And I love that because it, it, it protects Lashley, but it also gives El Patron this, I saw an opening, I took it, and I won. And, I, and it, fun, it, it's perfect. Yeah, and funny enough, going back to those um, pre-match video packages, Lashley even said it. He was like, the only thing that can get my way out there is me. Mm-hmm. You know, if I, if I you know, lose focus or, you know, overthink something or what have you. And the last time he – and remember what happened the last time he lost the belt? Overestimated yeah. his opponent. He thought Eddie was a joke, and Eddie ended up hitting him with the uh, the, the, the knee. Yeah, yeah, called him called him flush. So you know, this is a this is a great through line they're kind of doing. What I don't even know if they're aware of it, but if they are, great. If they're not, you know, it's still great. But uh, yeah, this has kind of been a through line for his uh, his last two uh, losses. Mm-hmm. I've always thought that if you if you're a wrestling promoter, you set the rules for the character. You don't let Lashley get beat clean. You don't have El Patron win via anything else other than a, 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 an arm bar for the sake of argument. Davey always, always, always consults with with Angeline. Like, you set these rules in place so when you write the match, you're able to then know, you know, Eddie will never use a chair on Davey, like they, for the sake of argument, or, or LAX will always have outside interference. So you can write the match to play to the character's strengths. Lashley's whole thing should be he only ever beats himself. It's his mistakes that cost him. He does not lose. And that also goes in, into mind. I think Lashley's next few opponents should be, you know, uh, Matt Morgan, Mahabali Shira, and like four minute matches in and out. Like rebuild Lashley as a destroyer. You're not going to do a, a rematch anytime soon. You know, you're looking at another four to six weeks before Lashley gets a shot on Impact. So give him fodder for the next two. You know, he'll have two or three matches in that time span. Give him just big fodder. Give him Mahabali. Give him Abyss. Give him whoever. 20 seconds, 90 seconds, a minute, depending on who it is. Just have Lashley run through these guys. So then El Patron is like, listen, I barely beat you before, and now you're even more pissed off? Like, shit, I'm going to have some issues now. Now, that's if you're sticking with the Lashley heel El El Patron face model. If El Patron joins LAX, then you switch Lashley to the face model. You still do the same thing, but instead of Lashley or or El Patron being the the, uh, on-the-ropes face, He's the backed by the the awful evil uh, LAX gang, and now it's Lashley this this insta- unstoppable force against a horde, and it becomes more of a war than say a match, and that that could work just as well. So we'll see we'll see what happens with that. Or 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 have him spin off into um you know a, a completely different feud. You know, sometimes when Lashley is in the sour mood, he'll screw the entire. He'll just be backstage being a basically a petty label, if you will. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so have him kind of just walk into somebody who also took a loss in the night, say a low key, and low Ooh. key has always been that guy who will fight in the X division, but he's not necessarily the X division guy completely. Right. So you can very much have one of those things where Lashley, you know, kind of bumps into him, and low key doesn't take crap off nobody. So they could have a great interaction, and that match, you know, match between them could steal the show. Here's my concern with doing anything with anyone who's lost. Loki and I was thinking James Storm are both guys I would love to see with Lashley. But you don't want Lashley to eat too many pins. And yeah. I feel like having both Loki and Storm lose, because I was thinking Storm, uh, wouldn't be great after just losing a major feud, you know? So, like, for me, yeah. that's something that I would maybe look at for Bound for Glory, because Loki versus Lashley on pay per view, whoo! <laughs> like, that'd be fun. I was thinking side L Loki, but. Now you got me thinking. Is is it the the ground and pound uh, t- tactician Lashley, or is it the striking aficionado Loki? Like that 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 right there is like yeah. that's and, interesting. Yeah, and and this is also another scenario where you have Lashley and a few where his opponent can kind of carry him, um, speaking wise, because mm-hmm. you know in that video package, like I said, with him and Dutt, Loki words were golden. He was like, "You've been dreaming of this, you know, X Division title, winning this X Division title for the longest, but it's clearly becoming." A nightmare for you. And he was like, 
you know, at Slammiversary, I'm going to wake you up back to reality. Like, all that stuff he was saying is just great. You know, with that, you know, that great voice he does, classic that, villain stuff. So That deep, no. powerful growl of voice that he has. Exactly. There are guys in Impact right now, and, and, and here's the thing. I kind of subscribe to the Dave Meltzer mentality of you don't want new guys in the title scene every month. You want Hiroshi Tanahashi. You want uh, Naito. You want guys who have been champions to be around that title scene because when somebody new gets in there, it means so much more. Part of the issue with the WWE is so many guys go into that title scene and then quickly back out, and it makes that title seem very easy to win. And if Impact can get on this idea, or Global First can get on this idea, where whoever the world champion is is the world champion, and like they they defeat whoever countless times, it makes that belt so much more impressive. There's a reason why John Cena, Shawn Michaels, and Stone Cold became so big. They all had title shots years, years, years prior to winning it. Stone Cold lost like two or three straight pay per view uh, title matches. Shawn Michaels lost every match against Diesel for the title. You know, <clears throat> and then you had um, uh, John Cena. He, he got fucking destroyed by Brock Lesnar in 2003. He wouldn't win the title for another two years. You do this, you, you, you start hinting at the possibility. Like, so have Eli Drake face El Patron, but have him lose. You know, have Dave you go against El Patron and have him lose. It's all right to lose against the champion. He's the champion for a reason. And if you have the best guys failing to beat him, then that elevates not just the title, but it's the wrestler. And there's this mentality among some critics and personalities on the internet where you're above brand or above title, as they say. Like, you don't need the world title. No one needs the world title. There have been organizations in this world that do not have world titles or a championship at all. There have been organizations that have done that. For a long time, Evolve was one of those promotions. They didn't worry about championships. They just had great matches. There should be no one that's above title. And that's why I applaud the WWE for when they brought back The Rock and Brock Lesnar for putting the belts on them because it made them seem like the reason they came back was for that belt, and it made that belt seem more uh, relevant than it ever should be. And the way you can do that naturally is by having a champion defeat uh, contenders on on a fairly regular basis, not just one every month or six weeks or what have you, but maybe one every other week. That's why Okada right now is so beloved because he's not losing. He's beating everyone he faces, and it makes that belt seem so hard to get. So when you finally get that belt, star. There's a reason why John Cena and Dave Bautista are the last two legitimate stars WWE has ever made. Because they were the last two to win their first championship like stars. It's simple booking, Marcus, but I feel like we're talking to Wall sometimes. <clears throat> so before we get into the... the, uh, the, the, the uh, extracurriculars of the event. Um, Kingston was backstage. So Kingston's not done with the company. He's going to be with them going forward. And it seems almost a guarantee now that he'll be part of LAX tomorrow when they film their, their, their shows. Uh, Mr. 450, John Yurnet, who was the, uh, the, the Saiyan dude, he had the, uh, the, the visor thingy. Remember him? Uh-huh. Came down. He was in uh, 205 Live. He was apparently backstage as well with Gail Kim, but we already knew those. And uh, Paige was apparently backstage as well, so there you go. <clears throat> so let's talk about the opening video, which was beautiful. This this video nearly made me cry because it was perfect. It opens up with the – Mike Tanay, in my opinion, will always be the voice of TNA, you know. He's just – it's just who he is. But there's the voice of, of wrestling, you know, like when you watch a match, it's Mike Tanay. But there's the voice of TNA when you watch Video Package. And that goes to Barry Scott. And the one that really sold me on him was in 2006. It was Sting Jeff Jarrett at Bound for Glory. And he was doing a Sting video package. Or I think it was a world title video package. And he, he was like, he was talking about Sting. And he's like, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, and the end. And I was like, oh, oh, oh. So I, I, I became a very big Barry Scott fan before I ever knew who he was. And then, you know, he, he, he became very big with TNA Wrestling, cross the line. And then when Hogan and Bischoff came in and ruined everything, he was gone. Barry Scott was synonymous with TNA hype packages. And Jeff Jarrett brought him back for this. And, and, and not just brought him back, they put him dead center for most of the video with that cool backdrop, with, with, the, with the light in his face, and, it, you know, it lit him up, and you could see him, and he looked so majestic. 
it felt like he had come from another plane of reality to tell you what you were about to see was going to be amazing. And it yeah, added he, so much to it. Yeah, even, look, even in a, in, in a new direction, I knew with James, there's absolutely nothing wrong with bringing things back from the past that worked. Yes. Because we lost a lot during that Hogan-Bischoff era. Uh, mostly, mostly our minds watching them <laughs> Blow their, you know, incoherent loads all over the place for however many years they did it. But, um, yeah, I mean, between the six out of ring, that, um, like you saw that, you know, tweeted JB about can we get a, uh, you know, before the bell. I miss those things. Mm-hmm. Um, before the bells, the, you know, like you said, the 10 across the line, all that. Hell, a, a good, what happened to the tell of the tape? I miss that. Right. So, you know, um, just little stuff like that, you know, is do wonders. <clears throat> just bring the stuff back that work. There's nothing mm-hmm. wrong with it. It's not, you know, Oh, they just doing what they did before. If it worked, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it because you can always put a new spin or spice on it with, you know, graphics or what have you. But bring mm-hmm. back the stuff that worked. And, I mean, he is the perfect example of that. So, Well, like, <clears throat> I, I know why they opened up with, with the tag title match because Jeff Jarrett's old school. He opens up with the most fast-paced match, which makes sense. It, it brings the crowd into the show a lot quicker than necessarily, and, and it sets the tempo. Usually you never saw the X Division title go first. You did under the Hogan-Bischoff realm and under Dixie and Pritchard. But usually the X Division title match was always in the last three or four matches, depending on what was booked, because it meant that much. And I like that, even though we didn't see the, the knockouts women's match, I think they're getting rid of knockouts, by the way. I don't know if that's, you know, 100%. We'll see. Um, it'll, it'll be the women's division, to be clear. Like, they're not getting rid of the women's division. They're, they're, I think they're going to change it from knockouts to women's. I don't know if that's the case. We'll see. But to have that get significant time, it, it went 11 minutes right before the main event. This isn't WrestleMania where you put the, the Divas match in a 90-second spot right before the main event because you, you, you had, you know, uh, CM Punk Jericho and then you're closing with Rock uh, 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 Cena. No. These, these were the three biggest matches of the night. And when you look at it, when you look at the card, how it was booked, the four biggest feuds all went last. There was none of this in the beginning. There was none of this in the middle. These were the, the, the four biggest, with all due respect to EC3 and James Storm. Because Eddie and Davey have been feuding since February. The, the knockouts in the X Division matches are, are, are um, brand-specific. They're, they're, they're uh, roster-specific. They, they do have a set finite number of people who can compete for these titles. And then the world title is the most important thing in the company. So it makes sense that these are your four big matches. And really, when you think about it, even uh, the the fifth match, the last, the fifth last match, or the third match, or fourth match, whatever you will, the uh, the the broken match, we'll call it, uh, even that had a lot of uh, of emphasis behind it. So it felt like this show was booked in order of significance, and it added to the the respectability and, and the importance of these matches as it went on, you got to the no- to the knockouts title and you're thinking you just finished the, the X division and now you have the world title after you and you have to perform in a way that makes the fans care about you in between these two stellar matches. It brings you to a new level of competitiveness and it rises your game and it makes the audience r- respect the fact that you are a legitimate title champion contender, whatever. So... Booking-wise, it's standard old-school TNA 2005-2006. This is what work practices, and I love that. Barry Scott coming back, fucking brilliant. Never not bring him back. You know, he, he should have a show on YouTube where he's just talking. Uh, he could read me the Orlando Sentinel. That'd be fine. Just like five minutes of him reading, you know, Chaucer or, or, or Moby Dick. Just that would be amazing. I I would so I I would listen to the fuck out of that when James Earl Jones goes because you know we all go sometime when he goes. I I nominate Barry Scott to be the new voice of Darth Vader because he's so good, so good. Ah. Um. Also, we we got Robert Flores and Don West. Don West being back after not calling a match in like seven eight years was beautiful. I never liked the Taz replacement. Taz was terrible. He was terrible in SmackDown. He was terrible in ECW. He was terrible in TNA. He's even worse when Don West comes in. And knowing he knows wrestling, he just doesn't know it like TNA did. It was so much fun listening to him. And it felt like that all over again. And I understand Mike Tanay's in his late 60s, now mid-60s, so he doesn't want to come back. 
Maybe he doesn't feel up to it. Maybe he's just disenfranchised with wrestling. Who knows? But having Robert Flores, who did start off rocky, I'm not going to sit here and give him a, you know, a complete and total, oh, perfect. Like In the pre-show, he was stumbling a bit. In the opening uh, tag team match, he felt almost a little bit overwhelmed. But by the strap match, he was starting to find his groove. There was a moment in the strap match where Flores dropped his voice to a very concerned pitch right after like a bunch of, I think it was like right after Storm went into the, the ring pose. And Flores is like, that's the last thing you want to see, or something to that regard. And the way he said it made me know that even if he doesn't get the cadence right for, for, for some things, and maybe if he doesn't get the moves right, he understands what he's seeing. This isn't one of those things where, where, where WrestleMania 2, oh, whoa, oh, whoa, you know, on commentary. Like, Flores understood the drama aspect, and that sold so much harder. And Don West was almost forced to be the expert, which in a way is funny, but he delivered. Like, they had great chemistry, and Flores unfortunately made sure to, you know, announce that, you know, the regular commentary team will be back next week. And I was like, please don't say that, Flores. <laughs> I've enjoyed you tonight. You and Don West have amazing chemistry. <laughs> They were beautiful together. Like by the main event, I was like listening to the audio because it was so good. And very few times you can say that about wrestling. Like sure, there are some JR ma- matches, some Tanay matches, where you, or some uh, uh, a monsoon especially, where the words kind of vibrate in your ear, and it just it rings a little bit truer. That's how I felt yeah. tonight. Yeah, I thought yeah, I thought it did a great job. It was a great change of uh, pace from what we've been getting. Um, not to knock Pope at all because, you know, we got him tonight and I'll pop huge for that. Oh, yeah, so did I. Um, um, but, yeah, I mean, it was a great chance just to hit Don West because he knows the product like the back of his hand. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, talking about how, how long he knows, you know, these characters and, and you know, things that they are doing, things he he's never seen them done was great. And like you said, Flores eventually got it, even if, like you said, they couldn't call all the moves because, you know, only like me and you and some people who follow – tediously everything um, can kind of fill those gaps but other than that it was great and you know for people who want to shit on it I mean let's be honest this and I think the G1's been going on um, for the past couple of days love Jim Ross to death he did mm-hmm. not you know he was kind of one of the solid points on the first night of that show so um, you know not to take away anything from him but you know that might be just him getting acclimated but you know it's ups and downs. Getting these, you know, comment- commentary combinations together ain't always easy. You don't always get a, a you know, Ross and uh, King or, you know, even a Vampiro and Striker. You don't always get those two things off the gate. So, yeah. but I did think him and Barnett did a, a, fair, a real solid job and like Flores and Don West here. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, the, 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 you bring up Vampiro and, and Striker, and the funny thing was, if you go back and listen to the first, I would say, day of taping, so that would be like the first six episodes, they weren't great. They were finding each other. They were trying to figure yeah. each other out. But now yeah. you listen to them, and they're like each other's hand. Like, they know who they are. They know what they're about, and they flow so well. But it took time, and it usually does. Like, that, that's just how it is. You and I took time to find a rhythm. Zach and I took time to find a rhythm. But Flores and Don West, on their first night, nailed it. And that's – I mean, Flores is no schmuck. You know, he's been – calling play-by-play for years you know he, he he's 48 he's been in sports for most of his adult life so he knows what's up don west is just in don west doesn't need to say anything he just needs to go Arrah! and then you're like yeah don west woohoo because <laughs> don west is just this giant ball of emotional and like that's amazing like he's just ah <laughs> love it by the way i loved uh the way barry scott ended the opening package for the uh the, the show tonight because he was saying, like, you know, you know, if you – I'm paraphrasing. I'm surmising. Uh, he's like, you know, win, lose, blah, blah, blah. You know, tonight's the night you become legend. He didn't say a legend. He didn't say legendary. He said legend. I love the way he just said, and tonight's the night you become – or they become legend. Like, they are, like, officially going to the next apex. Like, legend is a status. And I was like, that's so – I love the way he says that. Like, he's, he says things so awesomely. Ah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, fight uh, TV uh, fight app. Uh, I ordered it through them. Loved it. Um, definitely will we'll order it again. And they actually had a. Uh, I, I was having a, a shit fit before, like two days ago, because I was trying to see if there was the app available on my PlayStation. Because I got a PlayStation Four, and I'm, I'm going through the PlayStation uh, t- Vu or View or whatever the fuck it is that their TV app. And they don't have Fight Network there, so I'm like, all right, what the fuck am I going to do? 
And then they are like, yeah, we, we stream it live through uh, Fight TV or, or, or Impact or whatever. And I was like, ah, yes. So I was very happy about that. I was, I was very pleased. Uh, yes, yes, thank you. So overall, an amazing show. I need to watch the women's match before I give it a final grade because I don't like giving incomplete grades. But it's looking like a B, a B show overall in terms of a final grade, which is hard to get with me. You know, most of TNAs are either C plus or a B minus. Like this might be a B plus. Like two matches right. were under a three stars. So yeah, and for a match that we like, you said that that Steiner, uh, <laughs> that Steiner, you know, uh, Park match that was admittedly expected to at least be a two, if not, you know, which could have been far worse. That exceeded expectations mm-hmm. coming out of the show. A lot of people's favorite matches tonight. Yeah. So. I said that at best it would be the worst match of the night, and at worst it would hurt the company. I did not think it would be among the top four matches of the night. Because in my head, it's the world title, it's the X Division, it's that match and the, and the tag team title match. Like Those were the four best matches of the night, in my opinion. So that's that's really like you, you sit and you think about that, like, wow. And then you have to give props for the, for the, the tag match with, with D'Angelo Williams uh, the the women's match may have been amazing. Who knows? I'll have to watch that tonight and and and, and see. Like overall, though, like th- this was exactly the kind of show that TNA needed, and or Impact or Global Force, what have you. And the thing that really kind of made me feel maybe the show wasn't that great, Marcus. Like maybe I'm sitting here with, with some rose t- colored glasses on, and I'm th- sitting here thinking, oh, man, it's 2006 all over again." But the thing is, is the fact that I felt like it was 2006 over again is enough for me to say the show was amazing because it felt like TNA was back. It felt like this, after like eight years away at sea, like, oh, uh, you know, it, it's Tom Hanks on an island. Like, like TNA crashed on an island back, you know, seven, eight years ago, you know, and Hulk Hogan declared it officially dead when he came in. And we're all like, <laughs> and it, it felt like they came walking through the door right when Hulk Hogan and Dixie were about to, you know, start chopping the dog up and, and TNA kicks in the door with a triumphant, you know, scene, the camera pulls back and TNA's like, not today, scumbags. And then everyone's like, oh my God, you're alive. Like, it's kind of how it felt. <laughs> that probably made no sense, but uh, whatever. Um, it felt like a, a, a real TNA event again. Like it had that feel, that hype, that beauty. It was just perfect. Like this is quintessential what it should be. Global Force, TNA, Impact. I don't give a fuck. So they are going with Global Force at the end of the night. Uh, we saw the the uh, Impact logo with Global Force in the top of it. So GFW is, is their new thing, if you will. Uh, they're still going to be called Global Force Impact Wrestling because that's the name of the TV show. So they're going to stick with Impact. But they are officially Global Force now. Uh, which is fine. I just don't want the title, the world title, to be called the global title because I think that's stupid. Some things in wrestling just need to be the way they are, right? And 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 world titles shouldn't be called global titles or or international titles. They should be called world titles because that's what they are in boxing. That's what they are in mixed martial arts. It's what they are in every poor sports league. You're the World Series champion. You're the uh, uh, NBA champions of the world. You're the National Football League world champions. Like you, you, that that's what you are. So keep it world, don't go with global. Uh, but Jarrett did say something that I thought was interesting, Marcus, and I think you'll enjoy this. Uh, he said that rebuilding the brand is a five-year plan. Anthem has agreed to a five-year plan to rebuild the brand, which sounds right. You know, you're going to need a few years to kind of wash away the, the distaste of previous regimes and eras. The one thing he said is, by next year, I want to be live. And I thought to myself, now that that is something to be excited for because I was a, a TNA fan in 05 and you know, in 06 I, were you about the same time or were you a little bit later no about the same time yeah so you can remember it just like I did the idea of Saturday night at 11pm well gee I, I, they should really get a 9pm slot and then they get the 9pm slot and you're like wow that's awesome now they should move to prime time on, on, on a weeknight or, or two hours, one of the two, and then we get two hours. And we're like, yes, we got two hours. Now what we need to do is go on a weeknight. And then we get the weeknight. And I remember like that two-and-a-half-year span where the show kept getting bigger, longer, and better days. Like That's how I feel about Impact or Global Force right now. I feel like that's where we are again. We're, we're sitting here like, anticipating, like, this company should be alive now. Like After what they've done over the course of the last few months... They've proven that they've found their old groove again. Sure, they've had some duds, like last week's, this past week's show wasn't great. 
but they haven't really had a, a, a show where you're like, oh, that was just absolutely garbage from top to bottom. Although we've said that about Raw numerous times. And SmackDown's biggest insult is we just found it boring. So I mean, there's a difference there. But with Impact, it was been, well, that wasn't as good as it could have been. But it was always somewhat positive. So we know they can do good. We know that they're they're right on, on the path they need to go. And Jeff Jarrett even said in an interview about the Hardys, he's like, I, I have a very big affinity for Jeff Hardy. I, I like him very much. And he kind of like tiptoed around Matt, meaning that he and Matt Hardy do not get along at all. So I think, you know, once the Hardy drama subsides and and Rebby Sky just killed herself. Not 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 literally, not literally, not literally. She killed her 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 positive fan base. You know, cuz Rebby Sky has been been the victim. She's she's the hero in this, right, Marcus? That's how she presents herself. She took an unnecessary mm. slam against Lita today or yesterday. Called her a hoe Lita. against Lita. Called called her a hoe. Where did this come from? So apparently somebody posted a Twitter uh, photo uh, with Matt and Jeff and Lita from 2099, whatever. And then, like, the next picture was, like, Matt and Jeff and Rebby and, and Maxwell and whoever. And they tagged all the people in the photos. And Rebby's like, don't you dare tag that hoe in, in photos with my children. And people lit her up. Like, they came after her like a dog with a bone. To the point where she spent the next seven to eight hours slamming anyone who, who, who you know, called her out. So all of that good momentum that Rebby had built with the IWC, God, dead in the water. When I saw that, I was like, oh, I bet you Jeff and Karen are like, <laughs> dumb bitch. <laughs> Actually, Jeff, obviously not, Jeff, Jeff said a lot. Yeah, like obviously money. not knowing anything about the personal, but I would imagine that Rebby was nowhere near around doing that whole thing. Rebby was in high school. <laughs> He hadn't been with, you know, with Lita in years after that whole Ed situation. They split and they don't think they got back together. So it's like, I, I mean, at, at best, she's going off of stores from him. At worst, she's just, you know, a jealous, cold-hearted, you know, harpy. Mm-hmm. She was 18 when Matt and Lita broke up. So for for her to... No, she was, she was 17, or give or take. So for her to even talk... I, Here's the thing, Lita in 2006 or 2005 too, like she earned all those chances. She earned the hatred because she, what she did was fucked up. No one's going to deny that. But there becomes like a statue of of, of uh, expectation. If you cheat on me, I'm allowed to hate you for at least a year, give or take. If you butchered 9,000 children, I get to hate you forever. You know, like that's just the way it works. Like Chris Benoit will never be forgiven because not only did he kill his wife, he killed his kid. That is unforgivable. There's nothing forgivable about that because at least with a spouse, you, you there could be the maybe she was was the aggressor and I was defending myself argument. So there's 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 an argument, not not in Benoit's specific case, but I mean in general, there, there's always two sides to a story, but never with a child. What are you gonna say? My nine year old son was gonna kill me, so I killed him first because. W- w- you know, like most fathers would say, I would rather let my son kill me than kill my kid. Like that's that's just thinking that you can't wrap your head around, like killing your own child. So like Chris Benoit gets to be hated forever. But Lita, she broke some dude's heart and didn't handle it the best way. And and helped another dude cheat on his wife. So like, yeah, I'd say like she got a two year moratorium or a two year uh, maximum sentence of dislike. She's earned the fans' love back. She's come back to the business. She's been wild, widely accepted and hasn't caused any waves. So it's like, why are you still hitting her, calling her a hoe for no reason? Like, that shit's old. It's old and outdated. So, like, fucking let it go. Like, that's MySpace drama. We've advanced past MySpace. Yeah, she took a shot at it like somebody tagged, like like the photo had um, Sonny in it. Right? Like, <laughs> And even with Sunny, like most of her shit's to herself, you know. Like so, it's one of those things where like I saw Rebby do that, and I went, "Well, there goes all your goodwill." <laughs> now everyone gets to see you for for the psychotic piece of trash that you are. So I mean, good job, good for you, good, good on you. So anyway, uh, live impact. Mm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, overall, great weekend, great night. Uh, th- I I found myself kind of bored during some of the G1 because I, it's a lot of the same tag matches and and whatnot. Some yeah, of the, that, that, that first half was uh, the first half was straight. I I, I got to watch tonight, but I, I yeah, saw a lot of good things about tonight. Uh, I saw like the, the the tournament matches. I was genuinely intrigued by. 
Although the Juice Robinson Zack Sabre Jr. match was utterly, utterly, utterly boring. <laughs> and I find Zack Sabre Jr. to either never sell or never know when not to sell kind of situation. Like, he's very good. Like, he spent all of his training learning submission holds. Mm-hmm. Pretty, I appreciate that as a fan of Dean Malenko and, and Pete Dunne and, 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 and Davey Richards and Brian Danielson and, and all the all, all, and the like. But I feel like he hasn't learned anything else about wrestling. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's one of those things. It's weird for me too because I know he's one of the best in the world, but it's like his style is like it, it doesn't it doesn't have that that spark for me. And obviously, you know, to him to be doing half the stuff he's doing is extremely takes an extremely high skill level. But it's just okay, joint manipulation, submissions, and maybe a, a, a suplex here and there, and some kicks. But other than that, it's like he's not necessarily gonna hit another gear past that. No. So it's like. Yeah, I'm. I'm just like I'm, I'm waiting. At that point, I'm waiting on the Dragon Leaves, the Kenny Omegas, the Bucks. You know, even the villains if, of the world, the Ricochet. Mm-hmm. So, you no. Know. And and Ricochet popped up tonight apparently too. So that's kind of interesting. I will say this: watching the, uh, I think it was yes, yeah, yesterday's eight man tag with Titan and Dragon Lee on the same team. I was like, oh, Chad's a happy kid right now. Like I love those two dudes. They're so yeah. much fun to watch. They're the best luchadors in Mexico right now. Speaking of which, I do, I do need to hit this before we leave. So Johnny Mundo works for Lucha Underground. We know this. Mm-hmm. We know that Johnny Mundo also works for AAA. Did you know that Johnny Mundo holds three of AAA's top titles right now? Including their world heavyweight? No, but I, I'm i not surprised. I mean, the guy is one of the best. So here's where it gets really funny. So AAA's two. I'm sorry, Conan. Crash is still three in, in Mexico. Just deal with it and work harder. Number one is CMLL in Mexico. That's where Titan, Dragon Lee, all the top talents work is CMLL. Even Mystico, the original Mystico, second Mystico. The one, the original Sin Cara, he even went back to CMLL. Rey Mysterio wants to work with CMLL again. Uh, Daniel Bryan wants to work with CMLL. C- CMLL does the good work. Well, apparently, uh, back in the early parts of June, I didn't know this because I was catching up on my uh, um, Lucha Libre today. Uh, apparently, Mark Jindrak, wrestling as Marco Corleone, won the CMLL Heavyweight Championship down there. So now the top two wrestlers in Mexico are both former WWE uh, Tag Team Champions, John Morrison and uh, Mark Jindrak. I think that's amazing. I love it. I loved Corleone like, during most of his uh, run in Mexico, and he's never really been a champion anywhere. So, like, this was, like, awesome for me. I'm, I'm a fan of the guy. So, like, yeah. The match was fun, yeah, too. I mean, I mean, that's really interesting because, I, you know, just remember back, I don't think Mark Jindrak did a damn thing when he was in WWE of relevance. Nope. Barely did anything in WCW, too. He won uh, the tag titles twice, but he did in, like, the span of, like, like, weeks. Like, it wasn't that, like, an impressive of a run. Um, and uh, last bit of note, uh, Kenny Omega does win the uh, U.S. Championship tonight on uh, the G1 Special. They're coming back to America next year too, so that was already announced. Um, overall, like, what did you think of the first night of G One? Like, we're not going to go into a full deep dive because we're already almost an hour and a half, and this can be like three hours to render, so whatever. But what do you think of the uh, the first night of G One, real fast? Yeah, first night it was cool. Um, some uh, better matches than others. Um, I thought it was, you know, rather a shaky show for for New Japan. Um, it kind of felt had you know a lot of uh, Ring of Honor moments at times, but. You know, overall, the tournament matches were, were, you know, steady. And I think the biggest thing coming out of the show for me was the escalating beef between Omega and, and Rhodes. Mm-hmm. You know, like we've been talking about that whole thing between him. But, I mean, that spot with the tile was great. I mean, he just wiped his sweat, wiped it on his ass, threw it at Omega. And, you know, Omega just gave him this look like, you know you effed up, right? <laughs> like, so, so, you know, somewhere down the road that's coming, you know. I'm seeing, like, a lot of negative feedback of, uh, about Cody, which I find fascinating. Have you seen any of that online? No, I haven't. I don't know why there's this negative feedback against Cody. Like they're saying, like he's not the worker like uh, like uh, Okada or Omega is, and I'm like, yeah, but he's a lot more complete than they are too. Like he's a much better mic worker than either guy. Um, he overall he's got a more charisma. He he he's got lineage. He's got the ability to draw houses. People don't want to know this. They don't want to hear this. But Okada doesn't draw. As a world champion, at the head of the brand, he's one of the worst-selling world champions or IWGP champions in the history of, uh, of the Dome Show. When he headlines against anyone not Hiroshi Tanahashi, he averages 20,000-plus. 
which is like a WWE B pay per view size crowd in a in a stadium that can hold hundreds of thousands of people, like a hundred thousand people plus. So Okada's not the big time draw that a lot of fans think he is. What is gaining momentum though is Omega's and the Bullet Club stateside, which has helped boost the, uh, the, the the profile of New Japan. Without the Bullet Club and, and Cody and Omega with the Bullet Club, New Japan would be in, in I wouldn't say dire straits, because they've had worse, worst years at, at, the, at the Dome. But they wouldn't be expanding into America. They wouldn't have the, the, the depth or the roster or even the interest. So this idea that Kazuchika Okada is some kind of huge, big, giant draw in the world is, is untrue. He's a very f- solid draw. He's not great. He's not an all-time, you know, top-tier dude in terms of star potential. But Cody has done a brilliant job with every promotion he goes to. He brings in a bigger house than they had the week before, which, you know, I'm not saying he's dragging 20000 a night to wherever he goes, but Cody does bring people in. People are interested. So this this New Japan fan base backlash against Cody is is stupid. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. I didn't like I said I, I hadn't even saw or heard any of that. I think a lot of it has to do with because we've seen so much great stuff between you know like you said the Okada, the Tanahashi's, and and I would just feud with Omega that they're kind of used to a certain way these wrestlers you know do in the ring and are presented. Obviously, I think Cody has the presentation, but in the ring, he's more methodical. He does mm-hmm. things between his moves. He's not going to be the guy you see hit a, you know, 20 V triggers, right? You know, um, on a guy. You know, he's more methodical. He does things. He makes faces. He has the crowd reacts. So, you know, in that, you know, I think because of, they're so used to that Okada, you know, Omega type style, when he gets in the ring, you know, to them, it's slowed down. I guess to them, um, he's there, uh, what I guess Junior will be for us, Zach, in, in terms of just not hitting that spark for them. I get it. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I mean, it's not what he does in, in in his vein is kind of what they do in that vein. Like I said, that type of stuff works for for somebody like Kenny Omega at this stage in his career. So, you know, I think they just kind of got to get acclimated to Rose because he's not, I mean, you, great in ring. Even, yeah, even better, you know, in, in terms of his mind for stuff. And it's only getting better because of the freedom not, that he now has to execute this stuff. So, you know, I just think it's going to uh, just take some time. I think a lot of it is they see Cody as a WWE guy. You know, they, they don't respect him because he's not Okada. He's not Omega. But the funny thing is, a lot of guys, a lot of fans, longtime fans of, of New Japan still see Okada as that Cody type because they, they're Tanahashi guys. And the Tanahashi fans, they're, they're, still, they're still clinging on the idea of Muda coming back. So there's, there's, there's a lot of, you know, like, deep resentment in the fan bases in New Japan. And that's kind of like the thing that you see with a lot of Japanese uh, fan base cultures, like, like whether, whether it's anime or wrestling, or if you go over to Korea with, with or, or Japan with J-pop or, or Korea with K-pop, the, the musical genres, which are basically just boy brands and, and, and girl bands. But I think they call them, uh, what do they call the girls? Um, <sighs> uh, I forget the term. But like it, they're like they're a brand up, uh, onto themselves, and I forget what the term is called. Um, so like you see like a lot of resentment in between those. Like if you're if you don't like this one band or this one new J- uh, Japanese metal band, but you like this other one, you you suck. It's very much a young mindset. Like you know how we probably used to be when we were fourteen, fifteen, seventeen, eighteen. Oh, you like the Cavs, but you don't like you know the Miami Heat. You're stupid. It's kind of like those mentalities. But these are thirty year old people that are saying this stuff. So it's it's really, it's it's my, like, you say, oh, I like Dragon Ball Z, and people go, oh, so you don't like real anime. What? <laughs> Come again? So it's, and, and you see that in this in this culture now with, with, with New Japan coming to stateside. You see a lot of American fans embracing that kind of, if you're not my New Japan, then I don't want you. And I think that's kind of interesting because you and I are sitting here like, we don't like El Patron, but if he helps, then fantastic, <laughs> you know? So I, I just I, I find it funny that people are shitting on Cody for no reason because he's not – yeah, Cody's not, Cody's not going to retire at 40 because he can't see straight because his brain is decaying, you know? Exactly. They want these guys to be Shibata. They want these guys to be Brian Danielson. They, they, want, they want these guys to physically destroy themselves 
for their amusement. And I think that's so detrimental to your fan base as a whole, but also to the health of these guys. Like, I think Okada needs a four-month break. I think he needs to lose the belt today. I thought he should have lost it to Cody because I thought you need to rest him for, for January 4th. But no, no, we want to see him, him, you know, even more beaten up and bruised. And how great would that be? It wouldn't be great. You know, there's a reason why luchadors down in Mexico wrestle really well into their 50s. Comparatively so. And there's a reason why Japanese wrestlers are broken down by 40. So, just saying. Just saying, Hiroshi Tanahashi's got, like, gum holding his shoulder together. Dude needs a break. Okada needs a break. Omega needs a break. Although Omega doesn't wrestle that hard all the time, so maybe he doesn't need a break per se, yeah. but still. We, we see what's going on with Shibata, so, you know, take heed, people. Yep. So, uh, with that being said, uh, anything else? No, nah, that's, that's that's pretty much it. We cleared it. You know, anything else, we'll come back to it in the week. But uh, I think we uh, said, said enough. Hang on. I need to look this term up. I need to know what this because it's it's like a, uh, it's like a regular term that we use, and I fucking just ugh, yeah. I have no idea who any of these bands are either. <laughs> like I want to say it was like legend or legacy or or something like that. Uh. All right. Well, I'll, uh, I'm not gonna find it anytime soon. So, uh, yeah, it 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 is what it is. So, for Mark Screen, I'm Chad Porto. Thank you for joining us for Slammiversary's review. Uh, sorry for the length, but we had to hit everything, and uh, there's a lot of news that this weekend that we had to get to. Mark and I will be back tomorrow night, or tonight, depending on when you listen to this, or yesterday again, depending on when you listen to this. With Sports Core, we will talk the big moves of the first few days of free agency for. The uh, NBA offseason, we will talk the Major League All-Stars for baseball, and we'll, we'll deep dive into some other relevant stuff, I'm sure. So Mixler.com backslash Real Nerd Corp. Check it out. Marcus, take us home. Good night, me.